I love that expression that they use in Aramaic when they say Bshena. Actually, every time you enter a house, you're greeted by the one who's knocking on the door. And when you open the door, they will greet you with a Shlamalach, Shlamalu, or whichever way they want to, whether you're a man or woman, they will address you accordingly. But your reply generally is Bshena, Bshena. Welcome, welcome, but it's really not the word welcome. Bishena, the B sound, when I first say the word bishena, the that's a beth, a B, a letter B. And shena means in tranquility. In other words, you're safe with me. This is a time we're going to share together and you're under my household and you're under my protection. This is why I like it. It's just not welcome. It's a way of saying, we're going to share together now. You're safe under my roof. <laughs> I just love the way they use that, but it's really, that's, they use that word for welcome, but it goes deeper than just that word. That's why I like greeting you with the typical Aramaic exp expression, when we start every Wednesday night and when I do the Aramaic School of Life, <clears throat> which is once a month on Saturdays, the second Saturday. But this coming up, by the way, this coming Saturday, which will be April 1st, we're going to be doing the uh, third session on the human Jesus, but it's going to be on the Passion Week. <clears throat> and Jesus, even though he did he expressed different things in different ways during that whole week. He was always, always manifesting and showing his teachings. As I, as I said in the, and when I advertised it, that Jesus' quintessential teachings are in that entire Holy Week. So I'll expect to see you on April 1st also. And then Sunday begins Palm Sunday. And then, of course, the Holy Week follows right after Saturday. And I'll go into a lot of things that people have been wondering about. And it also will go into about the resurrection and, well, really death and the resurrection. I want to explain certain things about it that most people don't realize, especially the resurrection. So that will be saturday april 1st at one o'clock till three o'clock all right and just contact the foundation to participate in the class for the link for that particular session all right tonight before i do i'm going to open up with the usual short prayer that i do in aramaic so let us pray al -haile. Ruhe, the modern Ishua Mshiha, Sharenan, Milap, Milte in the Maria Allah Haya. Amen. All right. Tonight, I wanted to talk about the prophets and its meaning to us. And there's several things I wanted to teach, especially on the prophet Elijah. I know when we think of the prophets, we think of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Haggai, and all the other prophets, and that we're most familiar with the books of the prophets, but especially Isaiah is the most popular one. Then, of course, Ezekiel and his mystical revelations and his, all of his funny figures and things that he saw. But I'm going to be talking about two common prophets, but the one tonight. I'll be speaking about is, and I'm going to say his name in Aramaic, Elia. Elia is how we say his name. And his name is very significant. This is why I often wonder if this really is his prophetic name. Maybe his name wasn't Elijah. We're used to saying Elijah. Maybe his name wasn't Elijah. It was probably something else. But when he became a prophet, he changed his name, I don't know this, I'm just suggesting this, to Elia because of the way what his name means. Elia 
Elia, I'm sorry, Elia. Elia is the first part of his name. Eli, Eli, Eli has the sound of, it means my God. As soon as you say Eli, that's how we say that when we E-L-I, because that's how it's spelled. We say Eli, but it's really Eli. And that's the word that that means my God, my God. That's the first part of his name, Eliyah. Yah is the short form, we believe, of course, we're not too sure how to pronounce the second half of the syllable in the name of God. Everyone thinks it is Yah, which is correct. Yah is, but we say Yahweh. So the emphasis is on way, Yahweh. And that we quit using that and they use the word then Lord instead of Yahweh. And that's why it always says, Lord God, Lord God. But every place you read, Lord God, Lord God, Lord God, it should be Yahweh God, Yahweh God, Yahweh God. That's how it should be. But Yahweh God, pardon me, Yahweh God. Because that's how you pronounce it in the Hebrew. So his name is my God, Yahweh. That's the meaning of the name Elijah. My God, Yahweh, or you can put it in there. It's implied. My God is Yahweh. Why would he have a name like that? Because at this particular time in Israel, you know, Israel no longer is one nation. It is divided in two. In the south, there were two basic tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And of course, some of the other tribes mixed in it, but the basic. That was called southern, southern Israel. And northern Israel had the 10 tribes in it. It was a bigger, bigger nation than the smaller one of Judah and Benjamin. So Israel is split. And some of the prophets appear in either the northern kingdom or in the southern kingdom. Even when you're reading Isaiah, Isaiah would be in the southern kingdom. I'm not going to explain all that. All I wanted to do is just get the picture. And where I'm reading tonight, well, I won't be reading it. I'm going to tell, explain it to you. Is in the 17th chapter where Elijah first appears in 1 Kings. The book is 1 Kings, the 17th chapter, beginning with the first verse. That's how they broke it down. So we're going to El. Yeah. My God is Yahweh or Yahweh. Why? Why would he have that name? Because at this particular time, the God from the north, whose name was, and that is in Syria, and of course it wasn't called Syria, then it was called Aram. The major God throughout that whole area there was called Baal, Baal. We say Baal, but it's not B-A-I-L, it's B-A-A-L. And it's Baal, Baal. And he was the God of fertility. And he was the God of the rain and thunder. That's why he was called the God of fertility. Also because he brought rain, he brought thunder, he brought all those wonderful things. And most people, when they first read uh, in in First Kings, the seventeenth chapter, the very first verse <laughs> says, "All of a sudden, Elia appears." It doesn't give any background on him. She's called the Tishbite because he was from that town. That's why he was called the Tishbite. And and then he's carrying on a conversation with the king of the northern northern Israel. And the king's name was Ahab. And his wife's name was Jezebel. And she was very wicked. Well, how was she wicked? She was wicked because she resented the prophets of Yahweh, the prophets of the Lord. She resented them. And eventually, she 
killed them. She killed a lot of the prophets of Yahweh. She worshipped Baal. So she introduced a lot of Baal worship in northern Israel. And because of this, now remember what I told you, Baal is the god of the rain and thunder. He's the god of fertility. And much of the northern kingdom, they didn't throw Yahweh completely out but they made Baal prominent. They made him the major God. And it was spreading all the way through because of Jezebel, all the way in the northern kingdom of Israel, among the 10 tribes. And here's the contrast. So the moment you read Elijah, his name, his name says, my God is Yahweh. In other words, as for me, my God is Yahweh. That's, that's, you see right away, it's smacking right up against the God that most of the people were turning to in northern Israel. In fact, Elijah thought he was the only true prophet left because later on, Jezebel's going to murder a lot of, of the Hebrew prophets that were followers of Yahweh. And so he was thinking he's the only one left. Everyone is turning to Baal, and yet he worships the Lord God. And, and God told him, oh, no, there are about 7,000 people that have not bowed their knee to Baal. So, and there's another thing that most people don't catch. Because Baal was the god of the rain and for the fertility of the land. That's why he was called the god of fertility and the God of the rain and thunder. The first, what, how does it open up in that first verse in the 17th chapter? There is Elijah talking to Ahab, the king, and he's prophesying to him. And he tells him, by my word, I shut up the heavens. Mm, which he, listen to what he's saying. I shut up the heavens. You're going to go into a drought. You're going to go into a famine. Because I, what is he doing? He's, he is the prophet of Yahweh. But this God, Baal, is the God of the rain and thunder. He isn't going to help. And that's why the first thing, the first prophecy that we get and learning about Elijah is he talks about he's going to shut up the heavens, going to make the heavens brass, that nothing's going to get through. No rain's going to come down. This was a smack in the face of Baal. And most people, when reading it, don't catch on to that at all. But that is, that is the way it works. And I didn't even have these in the commentary. But uh, it, it's because if I commented on every single verse and everything that was in it, I would have never been able to finish. That's why Lamza didn't do every single verse either. But now I'm telling you something more you won't find in the commentaries. So right off the bat, his name and his predictions was a smack in the face of Baal. Now, the purpose I'm telling this story tonight is because of the way God took care of Elijah. And I often, when I was a young man, when I first started reading the Bible, and especially I started in Genesis, even though I didn't understand a lot of things, uh, when I started reading, reading the Bible myself, I was 16. And so I started reading and then I wondered, how come God doesn't do all these things I'm reading here in the scripture? He doesn't do these things anymore. It's because I didn't understand how God worked. God didn't change the way you're reading the scriptures. It's because we don't understand the backdrop behind the scriptures. And it seems like God is doing all these wonderful, powerful things. And he's quit doing that now because now we're in a different age. And just like what church, many church preachers tell you, certain church preachers, not everyone, certain church preachers will tell you that during the apostolic age, they did healing and did all that. That's all over with. We don't need that now because we have different things we do now. No, it's not true. And God, didn't change. Jesus didn't change God's nature. Jesus didn't change God's ways. 
He just showed us the real inner consciousness of God, but didn't change God at all. So how did God take care of this prophet? And why did I say take care of? Because Elijah is prophesying drought and famine. If there's a drought, there'll be famine. So how is Elijah going to be taken care of? And after he gave this prediction to Ahab, and Jezebel wasn't around, but of course Ahab told Jezebel, and of course Jezebel and Ahab would be hunting down the prophet, but he was, he was very elusive. You could never find Elijah. He was always going somewhere, hiding somewhere, being somewhere, and he was told in a vision to go by the brook Cherith. It was in a place in the northern kingdom, and he went there, and th there he could drink of the water, and he didn't have food, or he, because he had to flee from Ahab, and he had to flee from, he was always fleeing from Ahab and Jezebel. But worse, when, when he did something worse on Mount Carmel to all the prophets Baal, what he did to them, which enraged Jezebel and then wanted to make Elijah exactly like he did to the, her prophets and kill him. And he was on a, another greater run when he, when he did that particular thing. But this time he's just running because of the prediction he made especially against, this is against the God Baal, this fertility God, and there's not going to be much fertility. So he's on, and he's gone by this brook, Cherith. And what it says in the scriptures, the Lord says to him, I have, I want you to go there. You'll have the water there. He says, but I have commanded the ravens, the ravens to come and bring you food. Mm -hmm. And then when you go, as you read down, you find that in the, they brought food, the ravens brought food in the morning for his breakfast, and the ravens brought food in the evening for his dinner. So he only had two meals a day. And they brought him food. Now, when you hear the preachers teach on this, they say the raven, meaning the bird, the raven, <laughs> went and took the food off the table of Ahab and Jezebel. Because, you know, they lay out all that food on the table and the king and the queen would come and eat and then leave and etc. And these birds called the raven would take it and then bring it to Elijah in the morning and in the evening. Oh, yes. Do you realize they were set up on a system like we have today when we have breakfast, lunch, and dinner? <laughs> but I'm sorry that's not what happened. Although preachers will tell you that. And they added the idea that the birds got it, the food. Because, see, they had to be food that e Elijah could eat. So they had to go to the king. There's only one place for them to go, and that would be to the king's table and get all the food and bring it to Elijah. <laughs> and if you're reading the scriptures, the scriptures don't tell you. But it, the ravens means the Arab tribes that was there, and they probably were called the ravens that were living in that area. And it means the dark, swarthy people brought food to Elijah. They knew he was a prophet. So when the prophet awoke in the morning, there was the food for him. And in the evening, they brought food also for him and they talked with him and shared with him and they were glad to do it. Why would they bring, but they knew he was a prophet. And when you go to a prophet, he'll tell you different things. He will help and, and you, and they will probably ask him a lot of questions, not just about religion and about God, which they would have, but they would also ask him about some things about themselves. So, that's why they brought him food in the morning because they was they they'd heard that the prophet was by the brook Cherith, and they brought him food in the morning and food in the evening. No prophet would touch any food that had come from the mouth of any bird or the talons of any bird at all. No way. And besides, 
ravens, according to the Mosaic law, if you read Leviticus and you read it in Deuteronomy, it's there twice, once in Leviticus and once in Deuteronomy. Ravens are considered an unclean bird. And they weren't even supposed to eat it, but they also were, it was considered unclean. You don't eat that bird. You don't do anything with that bird. So uh, Elijah would not have touched if they had brought food, and I wouldn't have done it anyway, even if there was no Mosaic law, I wouldn't have eaten anything that a bird brought from its mouth or from its talons. I would not, not have touched anything that a bird brought. In fact, when I was in Hawaii, lecturing in Hawaii, and uh, I, I was at, stopped at a place to eat, it was outdoors, and I got a little bit of food, and I laid it on the table and I forgot to get my drink. I left it there and it was only just a few feet. And I turned my, my back and just to go grab my drink within that matter of less than 20 seconds, birds descended on my table where I had my food and they already had it in their mouth. You think I was gonna to touch that food? You think I was gonna eat it? No, I, I let the birds finish it and then I went and got a new one, I had to pay for some more food. I wouldn't have touched it. No telling where those birds have been, and especially the ravens and everything. And this is an unclean bird, according to the Mosaic law. The prophet never would have touched it. And people think that it, because it says ravens, they automatically took it to mean the bird. But ravens also means a tribal people there that brought him and they were called the ravens <laughs> and uh, they brought this to the prophet Elijah God doesn't change God brings us what we need but you know he uses human beings he uses other people God doesn't magically make the food come down just like they thought that Jesus made that the angels brought the food down from heaven and also the, the baskets too, because they only started with, with two baskets and, and the fish, that's it. And they ended up with seven baskets and food. You think, did the, did the angels also weave baskets? Quick, we gotta get more, more baskets down there. And why seven? Because seven is a biblical holy number. And that's why they ended up with seven. We don't know how many baskets they had when they finished but they'll say seven, meaning that's complete. They had a complete, completeness of being fed. But the bread didn't come from heaven. Jesus touched the hearts of the people so they would share their hidden bread and their hidden food and their hidden fish. They do that. And they knew that the meeting was over. And so it can, not only that, there were probably other people came bringing baskets of food they knew the master teacher was there and he was teaching. And they saw and if they saw when they arrived, they had baskets more of food and it multiplied. That's how it still works today. God takes care of us in all these many, many ways. And then the brook Cherith dried up. What was he going to do now? So he was guided to go leave because he had to leave because there was no more water and the brook was dry. So he went traveling because the Lord told him to go and not to stay. And he met a widow woman in Zarephath. This is still in Northern Israel. And he met a widow woman there and she was gathering sticks and he asked her if she could get some water to him. And she said she could. And she would bring water to him. And then he asked for food and any a little morsel, just a little morsel in your hand. That's all I want. Just a little morsel of bread in your hand. And she says, I'm gathering sticks to bring home for the little bit of flour and the little bit of oil I have left in my house. And I going to bake a little bit of cake for my son and me, and then we will die. But you know, she had a bigger household because later on you'll find out she had more 
people in the house and just her son and herself. It was that she had a whole household, but she would be the, the son would have necessarily get the food and she, and then she's going to die. And Elijah said, would you make the food and you feed me that food? And she said, but I, the oil, I, the, the oil, that's it. When the, that oil and that little bit of flour goes, he says, thus says the Lord, the flour will increase and the oil will increase. So he went with her home and she fixed it. She fed him. And as he had predicted, the oil never ran out. The flour never ran out. And then the story ends. How did Elijah do it? Well, remember I told you that he is known by the way he was dressed. They knew he was a prophet by the way he was dressed. In fact, John the Baptist is often likened to the prophet Elijah. Why? Because he dressed like Elijah, he acted like Elijah, and he pointed at Herod and Herodia. There's one thing he didn't do that Elijah did. When Elijah pointed at, at Ahab and Jezebel, which he did, John the Baptist pointed at Herod and Herodia. But when Elijah did that with Ahab and Jezebel. He fled. He fled. He didn't stay around. John the Baptist stayed. And that's why Herodia fixed it so she would get him put in prison and get his head chopped off. That's the difference between that. The only major difference between Elijah and John the Baptist. His ministry was just like John the Baptist. I mean, like Elijah, John the Baptist was doing that, just like Elijah. But what happened is he did not flee. So Herodia caught up with him. And of course, he was beheaded. But with Elijah, he after he gave his prophecies and all his predictions, and, and when he had slain the prophets of Jezebel, that is of Baal, and Jezebel went after him, he fled. He didn't stay. He, he really fled and got out of there, you know. And <laughs> this, is, this is how Elijah worked, but John the Baptist didn't do it. This is why I brought up the prophet Eli Elijah, to compare him with the New Testament. And John was the last of this kind of prophet, the kind of prophet that Elijah was, the kind of prophet that Elisha was, which was a student of Elijah. John the Baptist was the last of it because Jesus was bringing a whole new understanding. The pro Jesus was a prophet, but not like Elijah and Elisha and not like Isaiah or Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a priest. Ezekiel was a priest. He wasn't like them because he represented, he was a prophet of the kingdom of God. He was a prophet of the heart. He was a pro he was a universal prophet. And we don't he, we don't talk about Jesus as a prophet. We always talk about his uh, that he was a paroka. Paroka means savior in Aramaic. And we always think of him in just savior, 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 savior. But he really was a Nevia. Nevia. Nevia or Nevia is a prophet. So he was a prophet of the Libba, of the heart, prophet of the heart. And when you're a prophet of the heart, you have a universal understanding. That's a difference. Elijah, Jesus continued the teachings of the prophets of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. He was the fulfillment of it. But his actions were a little different and his teachings were a little different. That's why he says, that the least person in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist because he represented the old school of understanding, a consciousness that was of a different understanding about God. 
Jesus had a different thing. And what did he bring? What was he foretelling? What was he telling about God? He brought an awareness of the kingdom of God on earth and eternal life that starts right on earth, not just when you die. And he was a prophet of the heart. So here, Elijah is of a, a, of a different kind of prophet than Jesus. So when I refer to Jesus as the prophet of the heart, it's totally different. So Elijah then, God took care of Elijah when he was with this widow woman who wasn't even an Israelite. He went way out of, he had to flee out of northern Israel. And he went to Zarephath, which was in Syria, uh, uh, which would have been Aram. And there he took care of a widow. And they knew a prophet of God had come to visit this widow. And what happened? <laughs> Well, you never go to a prophet empty-handed, not with money, but they probably brought flour and oil and all when they went to see the prophet, and because that was a gift to him, they filled the flour there, the pot for the flour, and they filled it with the oil. That was that was wonderful gifts. That was food. That was how the widow woman, and it says the entire household prosper, not just the widow and her son, but whatever else she had in the house, it says the entire household prospered and got fed because she entertained a prophet. And that's why even in, you read this in the book of the Hebrews in the New Testament that entertains strangers because you never know when you'll be entertaining a prophet unaware. And that you don't know that the person is a prophet. But in this case, she knew he was a prophet. And that's, she said, she said that. And then later on, a third thing happens. So it mentions three different stories here of how God took care of Elijah. One, with the people who fed him and because of it, they wanted to talk with him. And then also with the one, with the widow, and all the people came to, to the widow's house to get readings from the prophet Elijah and to hear what he has to say and also predict for them and help them. And then there was a, the third story, which I don't know if I have time to get into it already at 733, but the third one, and then of course I want to get to your questions tonight. I didn't get any sent in to me, so uh, on the on the email. So I'll be getting to your questions tonight and I'll go anywhere in the scriptures you wanna go. Just put your questions on the chat room, but let me finish with this third thing. I, I'll, I'll try to cut it short. The boy suffered some sort of illness and she was very upset, very upset with the widow woman. And she says, it's because I have you here, the prophet. Why would she be upset with the prophet? As if he brought the illness on her boy and he had no more breath in him. And she said, he is dead. And she was, and you, why you've come to recall my sins to me, <laughs> what I have done wrong in the past. And now because of your presence, my son is, is in trouble here. So, what happens here? <laughs> what you get here is Elijah said, no, 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 this cannot be. Give me your son. Because she, she was holding her breathless son in her arms. It's very, if you can only see it, she's holding her son like this and then blaming the prophet for it. Because, oh, you come to recall what I've done wrong in my life. And now my son is suffering for it. So he took the boy from the mother's arms and brought it into the room upstairs and laid him down on the, the what they call the quilt or the bed that they laid him. Not a bed like we have, but like a quilt. Laid him on it. And he 
stretched his body on him, his whole body on him, breathe into his mouth. He did resuscitation on him. It doesn't say that. It just says he pressed himself or stretched himself out on the boy, which created the pressure on the chest. And he probably blew his breath into him. And he did it three times and cried out to the Lord. And it says, and the Lord heard Elijah. Heard him. Well, the reason we say that, how do they know the Lord heard him? The reason they know the Lord heard him is because after he did that three times, three times, the boy revived and the breath came back into him. That's the first time we have it in the scriptures. This is all in the 17th chapter of 1 Kings. This is the first time we have resuscitation mentioned in the scripture. And the prophet knew it. These prophets knew a lot of secrets. They knew a lot of secrets of nature. He knew that there was going to be a famine. He knew that there was going to be no rain. They were, they were close to nature. They were in nature all the time. The prophets lived in nature. They were sensitive. They could read the clouds. They could read everything. They knew, and they knew when trouble was coming, and they knew when the rain was going to come. That's all in the 17th chapter. And again, he was sojourning there with that woman. He was sojourning. He's staying. She kept a place for him. And you read other stories where Elisha did the same thing too. But this is how God works. He works through others for us. I'll never forget when I wanted to learn about the Bible. I mean, I prayed earnestly. And when, and when I was 16 years old, I thought, this is so deep and it's got to be understood. I know that, but I, I just thought, well, this is a different God in those days. No, God has widows. God has people who will come, all of that. And I'll never forget. And I used to pray for hours to understand the scriptures. That's why I could hardly wait to go to the Bible college to get all of this stuff. And, and, but I got disappointed when I was in the school learning at the, this is dry as chips, just dry. And I, my soul was shriveling in there. This is in San Antonio. Uh, I had already been almost two years in LA. And then I went on into in Ozarks preaching. And then I went on to finish in San Antonio at International Bible College there. And, and, and it was very fundamental. And it was killing my soul. I thought something is wrong here. I don't know what's going on here, but this isn't right. And there was a church there called Calvary Missionary Church in San Antonio. And the minister there heard me and he liked what he heard when I was teaching there at the school. No, I wasn't teaching at the school. I was a student, but some, they allowed us to teach sometimes. And he heard me and he invited me to his church and I taught there and they liked it. And he, he liked me also and what I was presenting. And I did not have the Aramaic then, not at all. I was uh, married, I already had, uh, my boy, my first boy, and my wife, the three of us, that's what we were there. And he asked me then to work with him on the church. And that's when I, because I had done pastoral work, I'd done pastoral work in California. And now he asked me to join him and to share, because he was an older man and I was a younger man, and to share the ministry. And that's how I got started in San Antonio at Calvary Missionary Church. And the minister's name was Reverend Frank Stribling. And it was quite an education. But when I had to leave the Ozarks, because I was doing missionary work in the Ozarks before I went to the um, San Antonio, I was doing missionary work and I had ran out of money. I ran out of everything. 
food and everything. And I'll never forget. My wife said to me, what are we going to do? We have no food. We have, I have nothing. She was nursing Stephen, my first boy, nursing him. But she said, this, this is it. I've got to have food. I've got to have, I'll never forget. I prayed that night. And I, what I, when I did the missionary work in the Ozarks, I had a, 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 a Willie's Jeep and I had a uh, trailer that we were living in. So we didn't have to live in anyone's home or bother anyone like that. We had a small trailer with a bedroom, a tiny little kitchen and a little table. That's it that I pulled all the time with me. And so because I was doing missionary work. So, but I didn't want to be a burden on people. So my father-in-law got that trailer for us and we went. <laughs> and so that night I prayed. The next morning I got up, opened, you know, opened the trailer door and looked there placed on the ground by the little stairs right there from the trailer was eggs and ham and other food. It was just there. I got it and brought it in. The evening food came and that was, my wife was shocked. I said, well, the Lord's taking care of us. This is how the Lord does things. Then I never found out who was bringing that food in the evening, enough food for us for all day long. Mm -hmm. And of course, even milk, they brought milk. It was the people in the Ozarks that was bringing it to us. I never asked for anything. They didn't know. How did they know? But they felt they should do that evidently in their heart. God put it on their heart and they brought it. And this is how. And then when I left there and I had one adventure after another, the, the one that moved me the most was the one when I was traveling and the first accident we have, I got a flat tire on the trailer. It just had two tires, one on the right, one on the left. And I didn't even have a jack to jack up the trailer to be able to get a, the tire off and to get a new tire on. I thought, what am I going to do? And I'll never forget. And again, my wife was complaining. She says, what is God doing to us? I said, God isn't doing anything to us. I said, it's just, this happens. And she said, what are we going to do? She says, you can't even get that tire to get it fixed. And just as she was saying it, a truck was coming down the road. And these people were singing. This was on a Sunday. It was about noon. And we were traveling from the Ozarks going down into Texas because we had to go all the way down into San Antonio. And so <laughs> this truck came by and these people were singing and, and they all were <laughs> African-Americans and they were singing. They'd, they'd just come out of church and they were happy and everything. And they saw us by the side there, pulled on the side of the road and, and, the, and the trailer there flat down on the ground. And, and they hopped out of there and they had the back, it was, uh, you know, it had a, a bin in the back and they had people in it. And they also had some other things, but I didn't know about it until they came out. And they said, brother, what, what are you doing? Do you need some help? I said, yes, I sure do. I said, I don't have a jack. Oh, you don't have a jack to lift up this thing to, to get the tire fixed? I said, no. Oh, don't worry, brother. I said, why? He says, look, look. And so the people, the few people that were in, in, the, in that back of the truck, in that bin type thing, hopped out. And there was every jack imaginable for any kind of thing that you wanted to jack up. And so I said, I don't believe this. And they brought it up for me, put the tire in the truck, took me to a place where I could get the tire fixed, brought me back and I put the tire back on for the trailer. And they left singing and praising God. And I was praising God. And my wife was amazed. She says, what is happening? And we had one 
adventure after another, after another. God took care of us until I reached New Braunfels, which is pretty close to San Antonio. And at New Braunfels, I ran out of money. I ran out of food when I got to New Braunfels. And I did have a couple of dollars on me. And I got another flat, but this time it was on the car. And I said, I, I need a tire. And they said, uh, you know, I, I used one. And because at that time, they were only about 10 or $12. And, and uh, at the service station that I was at in New Braunfels, and he said to me, um, this runs about $12. I said, you know, I'm heading to a Bible college in San Antonio. I said, I'll probably get a job. Can you let me have that tire and I will repay you and I, give me your card and everything and I will send you a check and money if you will please give me the tire. <laughs> and you know what he said? Sure, I'll help you. And he just gave me the tire. In fact, he put it on for me and all that. And he said, and I said, I won't forget you. When I get to San Antonio and settle, I will send you the money. And when I get the job, and he said, I believe you will. Just like that. But I had one, one after, I'm just telling the, the, the first one and the last one. I had one thing after another, after another, after another, after another. I never met people like I met in Texas. They were so loving and caring. And I was always at the right place at the right time, at the right moment for God to meet the need. I even met a Greek fellow who owned a grocery store. And I ran into trouble and, and the food was gone then because I was halfway down now into Texas. And they, they liked uh, my wife and me and the baby. And they said, ah, oh, do you need groceries? I said, yes. And they gave me two huge bags of groceries, milk and everything else as a gift. I mean, you talk about a mirror. I've never seen people like this. this, is, this it reminded me of, of people that you normally that, that live in a community and they know each other and they take care of each other. But I was a stranger and they treated me like they knew me and would help me. It's just amazing. That's how God works. God works like this. You're doing his will, his way. It happens. It happens. And this is what happened with Elijah. So the same God is the same God yesterday, mm -hmm. today, and tomorrow, God does not change, nor does his ways change. That was the lesson I wanted to teach for tonight. Tie it in with the New Testament. And don't forget, coming up Saturday, for we're going to continue with the human Jesus and the Passion Week. All right? Let's get to your questions. Annie, are there any questions? Annie? Yeah, Rabbi, not in my chat. Nobody sent me questions. You might want to check yours. I, I see. I've got on my chat here. Let me get. It's off to the side here, so I have to go. When we get our seminar going, we won't have to fool with this like this. It'll be in the center rather than on the side. Hi, I wanted to hear about your interpretation of the sentence in the Bible, Jesus wept. Well, this is in the Gospel of John. Jesus wept. And he went to Lazarus and Lazarus had passed on. And Martha and Mary, his sisters, were there. But before he got to the house there, Mary went out to meet him. Uh, I mean, Martha went out to meet him. Mary stayed at home. Martha went out to meet him. And then they finally arrived at the home and there was mourning and there was crying and there was all this going on. And Jesus just got through telling Martha that 
because she said, you know, I know in the resurrection, my, my brother will come up, you know, in the last days, he will rise up. And, and she, and she, he corrected her. He says, no, I am the resurrection and the life. What he was teaching her is that resurrection occurs now, not on the last days. And yet the churches today still teach that in the last day, even though you die and your body's rotting in the grave and all that kind of stuff, what if you've been cremated? Well, too bad. Anyway, <laughs> this is old oh, the teaching on resurrection. That is not the teaching of Jesus on resurrection. The idea of resurrecting on judgment day, on the final last day, is not a teaching of Jesus. That was an old teaching that came from what they thought interpreted were from the Pharisees and oh, that were at that time, Jesus didn't teach that at all. He taught something else. And this is what he was teaching Martha and then to Mary. And this is where he wept when everyone was crying and carrying on and oh, Lazarus is gone. And then Jesus was human. He felt their agony. He felt their sadness. He felt their pain. Their sorrow, their grief was so strong, it moved him. And Jesus wept. He wept too. You know, just like when, when Rabbi Lamsa, my, my mentor and teacher, passed. I knew he was not gone. I felt him. I always felt him. And I still feel him to this day. And I talk, still talk to him. And I thought, and when, especially when I started reworking his books, I said, all right, you know what I'm doing here. So he, I could feel him. And when they sang at the end, when they carried out of his body, out of the church, because I had to do the interment and the interment is not done in the church. The interment is, doing, is done with the people when they're eating, after they eat and you speak about the one who had made his transition. So when I was at the church, attending everything at the Church of the East in Tur in, not in Turlock, but in in uh, yeah, in, in Turlock, California, and there at the church, when they sang Push Bishlama, Push Bishlama, it absolutely tore the living daylights out of me. I could not stop crying. I mean, I couldn't stop it when they were singing that and carrying out the casket out of the church, Bush Bishlama. And it just tore me up. Tore me. And this is what happened with Jesus. He felt their pain, their grief, their agony. So he wept. He wept also. He couldn't. Couldn't help it. He was a human being just like they were. And he understood the meaning of a loss of a loved one. The very brother. And evidently, they were known in the town, Martha and Mary and Lazarus, and were well received in the town. And they loved them. Must have been very good people, these three. And Jesus always liked to stay there in, in Bethany. That's the town they were in, Bethany. And he felt it and he wept. That's how I interpret it. Jesus wept because it has to do with his humanity. He's still a human being. All right, let me get to the next one. Uh, please send me your, oh, that's a question. God doesn't punish. Was Elijah's prophecy about drought because the queen was wicked? In other words, wicked queen caused the drought? No, no, the wicked queen didn't cause the drought. Is Yahweh caused an effect? Uh, uh, so to so you shall weep. As you sow, you shall weep. Well, no, God is not punishing here. It is Elijah saw that this was coming. And he used it to denounce Baal and 
the ways of Baal. It's showing that God is the one who is responsible. That's Remember, I told you this is Old Testament thinking. This is Old Testament thinking. And I shouldn't say Old Testament. This is the way they understood God in those days. This is where their consciousness was. That's Jesus had a different. He was totally he was the apex of the prophets and understanding of the consciousness of God. Jesus had a, a real deep understanding of God. And a lot of things that are in Christianity today, we, we still believe in some of the things about God that they did in those olden days. And the consciousness was not fully clear yet. It hadn't fully realized everything about God yet. So none of this applies. Everything you, you're, you're saying here does not apply at all that you're asking in the question. It doesn't apply at all. You have to understand what Elijah was doing he was he was making it that now I'm going to show you that Yahweh is stronger than Baal. That's it. Plain, simple, nothing else, nothing else. And that's was Elijah's lesson. That's why his name is my God is Yahweh. So it has nothing to do with all this other stuff we got here. No, nothing at all. So keep it clear when you're reading the scriptures. And, uh, and God isn't doing this. This was going to be a natural thing. They suffer famine. Every once in a while, they still suffer famine. And, and they also get floods, too. So you see, but God, everything was attributed to God in the ancient world. But not when you understand Jesus and how he taught God. Okay. I had a discussion about the subject earlier. Does God hate sin, error? I respond that I, something, can't make this out here, that God is love and it's not about hate. What does the scripture say, Robbie Arigo? <laughs> when I say I, let me get, I responded that God is love and is not about hate. That's right. God cannot hate. God doesn't hate. That's used in an expression. When we say God hates sin, God, God doesn't hate. God is pure love. God covers sin with love. God covers sin with forgiveness. God covers sin with all that because God is pure love. What does scripture say? Okay, I just told you. God, you won't find a scripture say God hates sin. Okay, that's our saying today. Dr. Erico, your story put a smile on my heart. The people who helped you in the journey tell your loving energy and knew you were someone very special. You gave them something they will always remember, the gift of love. God bless you. Well, God bless you. Thank you. Okay. Can you talk about the consciousness of Jesus? <laughs> you In what? In five minutes or two minutes? Uh, Thank you, Dr. Rocco. Looking forward to this Saturday. Okay, I could tell you a little bit about the consciousness of Jesus. Where can you find a good layout of the consciousness of Jesus? Where can you find a lot of buildup about the consciousness of Jesus? Hmm. You find it here and there in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but you find a development of looking into the very heart and soul and consciousness of Jesus in the gospel of john it is john's gospel that opens you completely to the consciousness of jesus it's starting with the very first 18 verses in the gospel of john first chapter and as you go through you get you get a, a peeling away of the hidden consciousness of Jesus all in the Gospel of John as you keep going through each chapter. When he was with the Samaritan woman, when he healed the man who, wanted, who couldn't get into the water to get healed in the little pool that was there. It, it, everything is revealing the consciousness of Jesus all the way. It, this is what he taught from. Now, in the other Gospels, how we understand the consciousness of Jesus, he allowed time for spirit to fill his mind and heart and awareness. Consciousness is awareness. He was one 
the best thing I can tell you about Jesus for his consciousness, consciousness being awareness, his total 100% consciousness awareness was totally 100% centered on God. Centered on God. That's the best I can say, but I mean, there's a lot more to the conscience of Jesus, but that is the key pin. That is the one, the linchpin, you know, that makes everything go, the linchpin. He was God-centered. And by God-centered, I mean his consciousness, his heart, his soul, his emotions, everything was God-centered. That's why he saw and understood God differently, clearly, 100% clearly, which we don't even see today. You don't even hear much of that in the churches either. And they don't talk about the conscience of Jesus, no. But you have to understand, he had that consciousness as a human being. A human being. When we allow ourselves to get God-centered, understanding God, as, as one, one of the questions, God is pure love. God is pure joy. God is pure understanding. God is pure light. God is pure mind. God is pure consciousness. Mm. When that is totally centered in us, we have the same mind that Jesus was born with, but it was open and centered on God. He grew as a child, grew as a young man, grew as a teenager, grew through all that. And then either when he was in, Dr. Lambs, I thought maybe he was in almost in his 40s and not just 30. It says supposed to be 30, but he was probably a little older. He could have been 35, 38, or 40, where the mind matures completely, and he, he was God-centered, and that's what he brought to us. When he brought the kingdom of God, he brought the kingdom of God here on earth. How did he bring it? Not that it wasn't here, already here. It was always here. But he opened us up to enter the kingdom of God. And this is what he, this was a hard work he had to do with his disciples. He had to change. And this is what the resurrection did. I'm getting a little ahead of myself for Sunday, but this is what the resurrection did. It made his death, but it had to take both. It had to take his death and his resurrection to completely change their consciousness. And so that's why it, you have to understand his death and you have to understand the resurrection because that is what changed them to realize they weren't dealing with a political kingdom. They weren't dealing with a kingdom of David. They were dealing with the kingdom of God, which is the council of God, a spiritual understanding of God, a spiritual understanding of love, a spiritual understanding of, of humanity's oneness, a spiritual understanding you see, this is why in politics, you cannot legislate love. You cannot legislate it. You can't demand it. You can't mandate it. Let me tell you, it doesn't work. Doesn't work. It has to change the human heart. And what I mean by the human heart is the human consciousness. When you change the human consciousness, there's love. When you change the human consciousness, there's understanding. When you change this human consciousness, you don't have to worry about racism. You don't have to worry about misogyny. You don't have to worry about all that stuff because it gets in there. This is why when you become God-centered, you become compassionate-centered, you become love-centered, you become peace-centered, you become joyful-centered, you become all of this. Hmm? And Jesus had it 100%. And how to change that in his disciples was a tough job for Jesus, but he was doing it. But it took the final two things of his life to finally shift it totally in them, where they understood what they now were representing. Hmm? I think that's plenty on that, don't you think so? <laughs> All right, folks. I hope I see a lot of you on Saturday for Jesus Passion Week. Love you. Love you. Stay healthy. Sleep well. <laughs>